Hey third grade explorers, today I'm going to read a book that goes along with what you learned today in mystery science. It is called Secret Engineer, How Emily Roebling Built the Brooklyn Bridge. If you look at the bridge, can you just, can you point out what kind of bridge it is after today's science lesson? Okay. Emily Warren was a bright, shiny spark who loved to learn. Like many girls, she studied sewing and piano. Unlike many girls, she also studied math and science. In time, she married a spry young engineer named Washington Roebling, whose mind was just as hungry as hers. The Roebling family built bridges. Washington's father, John A. Roebling, was considered one of the greatest engineers of his time, and now he had a risky new idea. He told Washington and Emily he had designed a bridge to span the quick whirling waters of the East River and to finally link Manhattan and Brooklyn. He planned to build two colossal towers and sling a 14,000 foot web of steel cable between them to create the grandest avenue the world had ever seen. John wanted to send his son to Europe to learn about a new technology for building bridges. Emily insisted that she would accompany him. In Europe, Emily and Washington explored historic towns, tasted new foods, and studied the most recent advance in bridge building, the caisson. A caisson is like a giant open box turned upside down and sunk into the water. The opening at the bottom traps air as the box sinks, so it is dry inside. This allows workers to dig deep into the riverbed to find solid rock to build upon. These caissons, once fixed to the firm bedrock, form a sturdy base for the bridge's towers, strong enough to support the structure's weight. Emily and Washington hurry back to New York, buzzing with the discovery. So here it has a diagram of what they're talking about. It says one, workers in the caisson break boulders and shovel mud, digging deeper towards the solid riverbed bottom. Two, wagons move mud and rocks from the riverbed to a barge. John wove two caissons into his design and prepared to build the Great Bridge, but he died before construction began in 1870. Washington would have to take over as chief engineer. The caissons were larger than any ever made. The base of each one measured about 17,000 square feet. Just building them seemed nearly impossible, and that was only the beginning. Washington soon discovered that construction inside the caissons was muddy, dark, and sweltering. After hours in the caisson every day, he returned home aching and dizzy, but he pressed on. Washington drew plans late into the night with Emily by his side. Emily heard that some of the workers were falling ill with pain, weakness, and nausea. They called it caisson sickness. Then in 1872, Washington, like many of his workers, collapsed on the dock and he had to be ferried back home to Brooklyn. And I'll read you what it says on the bottom. It says, one, workers build the caisson on dry land. Two, then they carefully float the airtight container out onto the river. Three, once the caisson is in place, workers sink it, displacing the surrounding water and trapping air inside. Four, when it reaches the river bottom, workers can descend and start digging. Five, as the workers dig, the caisson drops. Six, eventually they dig past the soft riverbed and reach solid rock. Seven, workers then fill the caisson with concrete and build the bridge's tower on top. Weeks later, Washington still couldn't get out of bed. Emily insisted she be his eyes and ears and legs and arms. As Washington's eyesight dimmed from the caisson sickness, he dictated instructional letters to Emily and she read construction reports to him. Washington could breathe a little easier knowing Emily would be at the work site. But Washington's words felt clunky and confusing when Emily repeated them to the engineers. 
She faithfully copied the terms and equations, but they seemed like a foreign language. She was nervous. Construction on the bridge was only just beginning, and there was so much she didn't know. What do you think she does from here? Because she's like, there's a lot of things that I just don't really understand the words or the numbers that are getting thrown around. What do you think she does? So Emily started to read. She studied bridge engineering and learned from Washington and the assistant engineers. As she studied, the mechanics of the bridge became clearer. The main parts of the bridge were the towers, the cables, the deck, and the anchorage blocks. One set of cables would be strung between the tops of the towers. These ones up here. They would balance the pull of other cables that would lead from the towers to the anchorage blocks at either end of the bridge. The, the cables create the tension force and the towers create the compression force. A force is an invisible push or pull that acts on an object and together these opposite forces would hold the deck upright. So if you look, they give you a diagram. So here are the cables. This is the deck. And then the anchorage blocks and then the towers. And then they show you how these invisible forces that they're using help hold up the bridge. The push and the pull that's happening. The more Emily learned, the more confident she felt. As time went on, she could see the drawings come to life. As she saw the steel cable swooping between the towers in what she learned was called a cantanary curve, the perfect natural arc of a cable held only at its ends like a clothesline or a jumping rope. So that curve. She saw the tiny ink scratches she squinted at on paper transform into huge vertical cables called suspenders, which would shift the weight of the bridge deck to the main cables. She grinned knowing that each suspender could hold 70 pounds. Bring these ones down. That way. Emily learned that the Roebling design for the bridge required a new method of steel working that had never been used before. The cables were spun from thousands of thin steel wires twisted together like invisible yarn. The rigid deck platform was steady with steel stays cables that striped down diagonally from the towers like sunbeams. With the tower and the deck, each diagonal line formed a triangle, the very strongest shape. So these lines. No steel mill had ever been asked to make steel cables like these before, and the manufacturers wanted to meet with Washington to make sure that they understood the plans. But Washington fretted. If word got out about how he was sick and that a woman was in charge, the project surely would be taken away from the Roeblings, despite all their work. Emily understood his concerns, but she insisted she could handle it. And when the meeting came, she answered all their questions perfectly. So here's a drawing of the cables that they want. Four main cables carry the weight of the superstructure. That's everything attached to the towers. Vertical suspenders transfer the weight of the deck to the main cables. Diagonal stays steady and strengthen the deck and carry part of its weight. Bridge deck is stiffened by triangular plates at each stay point. More than 10 years had passed since Emily had taken the reins and the bridge was nearly built. She saw the main cable stretching across the wide river. From her window, they looked as delicate as spider silk, but she thought proudly of the equations she'd studied to calculate the cable's strength. But just before the bridge was set to open to the public, who had never seen a bridge like this, the public began to worry. The skinny wires look too weak, they said. The river is too wide, they said. Everyone will fall into the water and drown. Emily insisted that they were wrong. She trusted the thickness and strength of the steel cables, the stability of the diagonal stays, and the balance of the anchorage blocks against the towers. She knew the equations by heart. 
A week before the grand opening, Emily rode in an open carriage on the first trip across the Finnish bridge. She carried a rooster in her lap as a symbol of victory. When the Brooklyn Bridge opened on May 24, 1883, the two cities set off rockets and fireworks. Bands played from steamboats below all night long. Crowds gathered on both riverbanks and on boats in between to celebrate, to celebrate the great feat of engineering, never even knowing about the contributions of an insistent woman named Emily Roebling. So what's pretty cool about this book is that it does give us um, pictures during the time, actual pictures of what it looked like during the time it was being built, the Brooklyn Bridge. And then it does include pictures of what it looks like now. If you've ever been to New York, maybe you've seen it. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this read aloud. I'll see you guys later.